Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week on this episode, I have the distinct honor of welcoming a guest that I'm just now getting connected to, but I'm excited to have him a part of the podcast because I believe what he has is so valuable to the kingdom of God, to everybody, regardless of how you view yourself as a son or daughter of God, you need to pay attention to what this guest is sharing and what they're doing to advance the kingdom of God. So without further ado, I want to welcome this week's guest, Judge Roy Spartman. Judge Spartman, thank you so, so much for being a part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Ryan, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very glad to be here. I appreciate what you and your ministry do, and I'm glad and appreciate you having me with you today. Well, I'm excited to dive into this because I believe it is so important for where we're at uh, in this process as a culture, a society, and the body of Christ. But before we do, kind of give a little bit of a background of who you are so that those that are listening and watching on YouTube Live as well, uh, to be able, our YouTube channel, to be able to understand who you are. So give us a glimpse in who Judge Roy Spartman is. All right, again, thank you. Uh, I am a Baylor Law graduate uh, many years ago, and uh, I practiced law in Wichita Falls, Texas for a number of years and uh, was a district judge there for over eight years. I uh, also had the distinction of being on the school board in Wichita Falls for 12 and president for over seven. Then I moved to uh, uh, Dallas, Texas for a period of time and was a general counsel for a national company. And within the last couple of years, we've moved to Waco, Texas, where uh, we have a one of our daughters lives here with three grandkids, and I've got four grandkids about an hour away in another direction, and so we're privileged to be able to, to live here. My, my interest in um, religious liberty kind of started during my days as I was practicing law. My pastor was preaching through a series in the Bible, and he came to the point where he was dealing with the topic of homosexuality, and um, he had been, been given some children's books from the public library the children's section, and one of them was like, Heather has two mommies, and they were pushing a gay agenda, and those books were out in the front section of the library, and he, so he took issue with that, said they should be behind the counter instead of pushing the agenda, and encouraged the city council to pass an ordinance saying those books would be behind, they could be requested, but not push the agenda. Uh, subsequently, uh, the city council did pass such an ordinance, and uh, someone hired an ACLU lawyer to file a lawsuit against that ordinance. My pastor was subpoenaed to give a deposition and then also to appear as a witness in that case. And I was the lawyer that accompanied him on both of those occasions. And that began to pique my interest in this area of religious liberty. And I, I started thinking, well, this time he was just a witness. But what if the focus was turned on him and the attack was turned on him for his preaching in the pulpit? And uh, then over the years, of course, you see the things that the way the courts have, have conducted themselves and said no, no prayer in schools. No, you get in, you can't pass out Ten Commandments and then move from schools to county courthouse where they said, no, you can't post the Ten Commandments. No, you can't have Christ, uh, nativity scenes at Christmas. Then it began to move into the business to where they would try to dictate the conduct of, yes, you must do this. So for me, the next uh, logical place of attack was to go after our pastors in the pulpit. And uh, so that's kind of the genesis for the book of Pastor's Pit. And then I, I have two children that are on church staffs, and, I, and they both like to teach the Bible. And I could easily see that during their lifetime of ministry, they could be on the receiving end of this, of someone saying, you are saying something that is not politically correct, and it is hate speech, and you cannot say it, even though it's contained in the Bible. And so all of that kind of came to a head as I was writing the book of Pastor's Pit about the pastor that uh, was was indicted for the crime of religious hate speech. So that's kind of the background of, of what's got me to this point. Now, you, you write this book, and the storyline in and of itself is being clarified as a fictional story. But let's be honest, 
there's some real aspects to it and where we're at today from the time that your pastor first uh, encountered what he encountered at the public library to where we are now, we could say that there's so much truth and there's elements to this that is so real. Why is it so important to the readers to recognize that what you've wrote is not just a probability, but it's a matter of time become, before it is a real possibility for pastors and beyond that, Christians in general? Well, I think we began to see a pattern already as I explained it. But I think the pandemic just kind of put this on steroids a little bit. You know, as you as we've gone through the, the pandemic and you would see pastors that would be put under attack by mayors, by governors, uh, and there are legislative bodies now that are passing laws that would try to restrict what a pastor can say. And so I, I think that's just kind of advanced the agenda and, and caused it to speed up tremendously. And I, I did try to take some elements of reality. You know, I think a lot of times we'll hear the words religious liberty. It almost comes across, across as clinical and sterile and legal and all of that. So what I wanted to do was to try to put it in a context of an everyday story that people could relate to, to see how easily this freedom could be lost and how easily and readily available it would be for someone to start attacking our pastors. And so basically, I think the last time I checked, 47 states have hate speech statutes plus D.C., and we all celebrate hate speech statutes. You know, nobody should be engaging in hate speech. But the problem is that and what I did is I took the Oregon hate speech statute and inserted one word, religion, and that was the basis upon which the district attorney was then able to indict the pastor for saying something that went against another religion's beliefs. Um, these, these hate speech statutes, they don't give a definition of what is hate speech, uh, so you don't know. And, and, and in the religious context, what I tried to do in the, in the book was to say, okay, who's going to get to decide what is religious hate speech? Do the pastors now have to go to the district attorney or to judges and say, uh, is this okay if I say that, a, that marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman like the Bible says? Oh, no, that's hate speech. You can't say that. So where are we going to set it? And, and to me, there are a number of the things that I tried to incorporate into the book that either have occurred or I can easily see occurring and uh, to try to give a, a pattern. And the impact of, of what could happen to our pastors is not just, oh, the pastor gets indicted. The, the, the impact just goes out like ripples after a rock goes into a pond. It happens, not the impact is not only to the pastor, but it's to his wife, it's to his kids, it's to his church, the various members of the church. If you have kids that are members of that church and they go to a school, it carries forward into the school activity. I mean, it, so I wanted the, the readers to be able to understand the realistic potential that I believe can very easily and readily happen uh, in our society today. I, I think I think it's a very real, real scenario, even though I tried to write it from a more easily to, easy to read fictional perspective. I think there could be a lot of potential for reality there. You said that there was 47 states that have somewhere articulated uh, a form of hate speech, but it's inconclusive considering that, you know, it's not accurately defined exactly what is hate speech. Why is it that we have so many, do you believe that we have so many in the church, pastors, whatever the case may be, that aren't paying attention to this, that aren't giving it the insight and the knowledge and the understanding of how dangerous we are to losing so many religious freedoms? Well, Ryan, that is a great question, and I think it's probably got some complexity in terms of number of things that might have contributed to it. Um, I think one is that a lack of recognition uh, of the issue as quickly as we should have recognized it, you know, kind of like the frog in the water as it starts warming up. We don't recognize it until suddenly the water is boiling, and I think that, that there's an element of that that we as as Christians and people of faith that support religious liberties have, have not recognized how quickly uh, this thing could come upon us. Again, I think the pandemic suddenly awoke a group of, of people that said, whoa, 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 time out. Wait, what, what is this? So I think that it, there's been a slowness to, to wake up to it. I think also as people of faith, we sometimes have a difficult time in trying to balance how do I communicate that God is God of love but stand on principle. And so I think sometimes we get a little intimidated because we think, well, if I say that, people are going to think I don't love or that God doesn't love. And so I, I think we allow those kinds of things to intimidate us. 
And, and I think also there's a, a component part that none of us want to be the nail sticking up that gets hit by the hammer, right? So we we kind of tend to to step back and say, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll let Ryan do that one. I, I don't think I'm going to stick my neck out right now and do that. I think there could be a, a number of factors like that that could have contributed to it. But I, one of the things I hoped in the pastor's pit was to create an awareness and say, you know, we do need to be awake. We do need to be aware of what's going on. And one of the things that I've kind of seen a little bit of from a legal perspective is what I've called a paradigm shift. Early on, it, it was the, the, the people that were hostile to religious liberty that would go to the courts and say, stop them from having prayer, stop them from passing out Bibles, stop them from the Ten Commandments. And the court, Supreme Court was going along with it. But the shift has come now to where I believe that a lot of the attack is coming from elected officials. You know, for example, now we have the, the Equality Act in, in the U.S. House of Congress that has been passed that, you know, says you cannot discriminate uh, against other people and there's no religious exemption or exception for that. So, again, if a pastor wanted to preach that that marriage is between a man and a woman, well, the, the Equality Act would say you can't do that. And religious exemption does not apply to that. So you have legislative bodies that are passing them. You have um, governors and you have mayors that are issuing edicts themselves. Those people are elected officials. And that's what's different to me is that it's coming from a different group now. So we as believers and people of faith, I think one of the things that we could consider is, hey, wait a minute. We elect those people. We, we can vote those people out. So maybe we need to encourage some people to run that have religious liberty as an important plat- part of their platform. Maybe I need to give a little bit of money to that candidate. Maybe I need to get out and actively help them. So I think that there can be some hope in that the shift has allowed us a vehicle by which we can begin to try to attack it. We're in its genesis now. You know, when you had to re- try to replace U.S. Supreme Court justices, that's a long, hard road to try to travel down. But now if we can do it by replacing some of these legislative officials, mayors and governors, then then I think that that's doable. We can do that. If we unite, if the body of believers unite, those that support religious liberty unite, we can make a difference there. And so I would like to encourage that as well. One of the things that really fascinated me last year, because as you are reminding people about how the pandemic really began to expose some of this agenda and everything that's kind of been advancing with that is you had groups, we'll say two different groups of Christians, ones that were going, hey, we got to pay attention to what's happening here, what they're doing in California, what they're doing in New York, what they're doing in other states, Michigan, this is very alarming and we have to do that. But then you had this other group of Christians that was saying, we're overreacting. This is not as big a deal. We just need to abide by what the government is saying. We need to abide by the CDC. We need to abide by all this. And how do you portray the alarm that our religious liberties are being infringed upon and dangerously close to being removed to the group of Christians who are adamant that we're really not losing our religious freedoms? Is, are there some examples that you can share with them to get them to begin to understand what exactly is at, at stake here? Sure. Uh, um, two or three things here. One, you know, there, there is a biblical principle that we're to submit to the governing authorities, you know, that they've been in place yes. by God. And at the same time, you have in, in the New Testament where, uh, you know, that you have the apostles that are saying, no, I, I, I have to speak for God and I have to, to stand on the, the side of God. And so there's there can be some tension there. Um, and I think a lot of people of faith early in the pandemic, when there was so much unknown, were trying to. Uh, submit to the governmental authority and find alternative ways, whether it's online or Facebook or whatever, to, to have their get their message out. But then when you began to see that there were, um, you know, for example, casinos that could be open and churches could not, and they, there be, became such an inconsistency there, then I think a lot of believers began to take the position, oh, no, you, you have stepped across the line, and now we, we need to stand up and protect our religious liberty. So I think I think there can be a a period of time like we had where it might be that we have to find alternative ways to get our message out, not to shut it down, but alternative ways because the government's telling us that. But I also think there's a time where we need to stand up. Uh, I could give you some examples. Um, uh, Pastors are currently charged or threatened for conducting worship in church services or have been. A lot of them have loosened within the last couple of weeks, but that occurred in California, Colorado, Illinois, Kentucky, Virginia. 
Uh, basically, some uh, church doors were put in the equivalent of house arrest in Kentucky for attending Easter Sunday services. You know, one of the things that I think is really frightening to me is what's happening in the area of school. Uh, in the Iowa Public School District, uh, they taught transgenderism and homosexuality to students at all grade levels, including preschool. And uh, they gave a children's coloring book that said, everyone gets to choose if they're a girl or a boy or both or neither or someone else, and no one else gets to choose for them. I thought, wow. And then I read recently in Orange County, California, the Board of Education issued an opinion that said, quote, I want to read it so I get it right. Parents who disagree with the instructional materials related to gender, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation may not excuse their children from this instruction. You know, as I thought about that, I thought as a parent, a grandparent, as a former school board member, do what now? The parents can't excuse their kids from this education? Are you, are you kidding me? You know, when I was on school board, we had a sex education program. We tried to be very careful about what it taught, but we always gave an opt-out provision so that if parents felt like that's not where I want my child to be, okay, opt out. Mm -hmm. But now to say we're going to teach this agenda and parents, you can't opt out. Those are just a few of the areas that, that I'm continuing to see. I mean, in this last high school graduation cycle, we saw um, – Again, a valedictorian that was said, no, you can't reference your faith. And they're, they're still trying to attack them that way and limit them and say, oh, no, that violates the establishment clause. So the attack is continuing. And, uh, I, you know, we had one governor that said, if you don't if you don't close now, I'll shut you down permanently. And, and I thought, oh, so I think that we should take the, the threat very real. And from what I have seen, for the most part, those people are tireless in their agendas. They, they don't understand be nice and love me and love you. It's we've got an agenda and we're going to push it and we're going to cram it. And, you know, we may not win today, but we're going to keep pushing until we do win. And so I think, you know, they only understand strength. And I, and I hate to say this, but I think we as believers of religious liberty and people of faith have to decide I'm going to stand here. You know, I'm not I'm not going to continue to be pushed. I'm going to try to still communicate the gospel of love, but I'm going to stand on principle. And I think that we have to be uh, willing to do that. I think back a couple of episodes, I actually had the honor of hosting Jack Phillips, who many people know as the Christian baker, who some years ago in uh, his bakery, he had two men that came in and wanted him to bake a cake for their um, marriage ceremony of two men. And his convictions as a Christian would not permit him to do that. Now, he backed up and he had years of where he wouldn't even create Halloween cakes. He wouldn't create uh, perverted cakes for a bachelorette or bachelor parties or anything like that. But we've sat back and we've watched this man's journey and the ups and downs, the verdicts come in his favor and not come in his favor. And there's still a group of people that goes, my gosh, it's just a cake. Why not bake the cake? Now, fast forward to where we're at now. And we saw how, or we're seeing how people can turn away people in their businesses for not being vaccinated or not wearing a mask. And for years we were told you got to bake this cake regardless. Now we're seeing this as you're portraying and, and telling this about school systems. And I remembered instantly, I remembered uh, when my children were younger signing that about the sex education. And we would, you know, say we didn't want our children in that because we didn't know what the public school was teaching in that side of it. These things are creeping in more and more and more and more. What is a definitive, simple alarm that you could share with Christians to say, it's more than these little things that, that, because I think a lot of times, let me say it this way. I believe a lot of times Christians are, are not paying attention to this because it's not happening in their little community. So they think. It's not happening in my world, so why should I pay attention to it? You mentioned California, you mentioned Michigan, you mentioned Virginia, Kentucky. I don't live in those states, so why should I pay attention to that? But what is it that you could signal to those that are listening? They, they, maybe they're living in a small community. Maybe they're living in a larger city and they're just not paying attention. What is something 
that you can point them to to say, hey, you need to recognize what is happening. This just isn't big cities and big states, but these things are creeping into our systems on every single level. That's right. I think you're exactly right. You know, there's an old adage. Uh, I may not get it exactly right, but it says, I can take no joy if the hole's in your end of the boat, right? I mean, if there's a hole in your end of the boat, that means we're both probably going to sink in that boat together. Yeah. I can take you right now to some cases that uh, where religious liberty has been attacked uh, against the Jews, against Catholics, against Mormons, against Muslims, against the Native Americans. I mean, it, it is it is going cross culture. So if if religious liberty in our Constitution goes away, then it doesn't impact just Christian faith. It impacts all of these other faiths that have their their holy books that they believe in and their holy tenets of faith that they believe in. And so I think one place we start is right there. It's not it's not something that um, is going to just I, I think one of the things in today's society is it's okay to believe anything except what might be a Christian belief. And so mm-hmm. sometimes we, we begin to think, okay, well, it's just us against the world. But in this context, in the area of religious liberty, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat. So a hole in my end of the boat as a Christian should not give comfort to anybody of another faith that's in the other end of this boat, because so the boat good. will go down for all of us. And, and uh, you know, I think so many times, what we have seen is is these things are very incremental, at least from the, the legal standpoint and the way it occurs. And uh, again, hate speech statutes, nobody can really say, oh, don't have hate speech statutes. And it sounds so good if they say, well, in this hate speech statute, I'm going to include the word religion so that nobody can say hate speech against religion. I mean, that sounds so good. I mean, it, it just sounds great. OK, you can't say anything like that. But the problem is, what what is religious hate speech? I mean, it is if your your faith says uh, a marriage between uh, two females is is acceptable and right. If I say the Bible says that's not right, have I suddenly engaged in religious hate speech? And so it, I think we just have to be very very cautious. And I would just say there there have been other areas in our society where we have uh, suddenly had things that have crept up on us, uh, and suddenly we are we are right in the middle of the fire. And I think this is one of those. Again, the courts act incrementally, just like they did with your baker that you you uh, acknowledged a moment ago. He's back in court now, right? And it was over a, a transgender that came in to get him to bake a cake specifically to make an issue out of him. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, this last week, the uh, uh, Philadelphia versus Fulton case that involved the Catholic charities came out. It was it was nine oh in favor of religious liberties. Um, and so we take great joy in that. I mean, I think we celebrate that. We think, man, that's a, a great thing to have even what we view as the, the liberals say that they recognize a constitutional right of religious liberty. Uh, and so we go through that. So, but, but one, one part that is kind of troubling about that is just like your Baker friend, that's, that Supreme Court opinion originally was so very finely tailored to that specific fact situation, and they didn't go ahead and say his religious liberties were protected, that now he's back in there again. And so he's having to go through the process again. Well, in the Catholic Charities case, um, the court basically said the way this ordinance is worded and the way this contract is worded, yeah, they, they, they made it an exception. And once they start doing that, they need to be sure that they treat these religious folks the same. And so it was very finely worded. And they didn't go ahead and say on a purely religious liberty basis, the constitutional provisions would make this ruling. Uh, Justice Salito, who is, I think, becoming one of the real um, strong, strong justices for religious liberty, he made the comment, he said, uh, they might as well be, this opinion might as well be written on dissolving paper, sold in magic shops. And the reason he did that was because apparently the Supreme Court, in its opinion, said how Philadelphia could go back and rewrite their contract and their ordinance, and perhaps it would pass scrutiny, and so they could still get the same results. I know I'm getting a little long and a little deep in the details here, but I'm just trying to say that that uh, the way the Supreme Court we're taking, we're, we're rejoicing in what the, some of the opinions and the conclusions that are being reached, but this battle is going to keep going, and just like the Baker is in court again, I'm fearful that the Catholic Charities in that case, maybe back in court again. And so we just have to keep fighting these battles. It's just, we're, we're doing it increment inch by inch. We're not being able to do it, you know, touchdown by touchdown. We're doing it inch by inch. 
this really helps me out a lot because I was just, I mean, just this morning, I was listening to some reports concerning that uh, case with the Catholic um, and the adoption agency and all that and everything. And it seems for all intents and purposes, it feels like a win for Christians, but the LGBTQ plus community is actually celebrating as well uh, in that landmark decision. And so it's like, well, wait a minute, how does this appear as a win but they're also celebrating there's that loophole. And, and this is one of those things that fascinates me because I'm definitely not on the level that you are in my understanding, my knowledge, my experience, all that stuff. But I'm a firm believer in the Constitution of the United States. I think it is hands down one of the greatest documents, governmental documents on the face of the earth in the history of mankind. Uh, have we made flaws? Absolutely. But the beauty of the Constitution is we can amend those things. But here's one of the things I believe a lot of people fail to understand. And, and this case is one of those things that you're alluding to and you're highlighting is that there are limits in that construction of that. I, is it is it simply a lack of knowledge, the ignorance on our part, or is it one of the things that we need to really educate ourselves on more about understanding religious limits in the constitution and what you're talking about that wording then that specific theme because again we go back to the baker he is or he just i actually saw the verdict he actually lost this one with the transgender uh issue at hand and so it's like one victory and you're talking about that one one step at a time and stuff in that process why it's so important that we educate ourselves because of the limitations that we are facing right now. Yeah, and that, that's very, very true. And I, again, I want us to celebrate the fact that the right answer was reached in the Catholic Charities Philadelphia case. I mean, I think we right. need to celebrate that and say, okay, there was at least acknowledgement by all nine Supreme Court justices that there is religious liberty in the constitution. I think when you say that the LGBTQ community is is celebrating it as well is because it was so very limited to the facts of that case. And it was written in a way that would give them hope that, hey, Philadelphia, you go back and change your contract and your ordinance, and it may pass constitutional muster. And that's some of the frustration of some of the what I call concurring and dissenting justices like Alito of saying, look, this is tied to an old case, the Smith case, that put some some barriers in there that that we don't we shouldn't do we should just go back to the plain wording of the constitution where it says religious liberty and and the government shall not establish a religion and and uh, so it I, I think we have to look at it carefully and and to be sure and, and it's hard to to get too deep into it without trying to get too technical about some of the arguments that are made and some of the I mean it's like a hundred page opinion so it's not like it's a, a three page opinion that you could just pick up and say yeah I got this really quickly. Uh, so I, I, I just would continue to echo what you're saying is be alert, be awake, uh, continue to stand. Don't think that because there was a 9-0 Supreme Court opinion on religious liberty that we have won. It, there is a victory in that case, and we celebrate it, and we appreciate it, and we want it to continue. But that was such a narrow written decision and narrowly written opinion that we can't say that, you know, it may be a, a skirmish that we won, but I don't know that we can say we won the war yet. The war still going. That's what I was fishing to ask. It, it's it's a small victory, but let's be honest: the battles are going to keep growing because there's a war that is ever increasing against uh, Christianity as a whole. And you brought up too that there's there's also things that have happened against Mormons, Jews. Uh, Hindus or, or Muslims and so on and so forth. But it seems like the attention has really, um, with the exposure of everything coming with the pandemic year, towards Christianity in this process. So do you believe that as this keeps going, that we're going to see that day when, uh, especially pastors, but Christians in general, will not be able to share biblical truths and principles of our faith? I, I got to the point of writing a pastor's pit because my fear is and was that that is a very, very real scenario. Um, I think one of the things that people of faith forget is that the Supreme Court gets to interpret religious liberty. 
and what is and what is not. I mean, you know, we may disagree with their conclusion on this one, but for example, in the Mormon area, there was a statute in that and a person was convicted of polygamy and the Supreme Court said, oh, well, that's okay. Uh, you know, we accept that that's a restriction on their faith that they should not engage in. And so, you know, I, I think we have to start with the understanding that uh, how important the Supreme Court is in this, because if, if the Supreme Court goes to the point where over a period of time, the hostility to religious liberty becomes so accepted and, and so prevalent that legal scholars, judges, and particularly Supreme Court justices begin to accept that conclusion, they can interpret that uh, provision of the Constitution to the point where it has absolutely no meaning. I mean, it could, it, you know, and they could say, oh, we're going to apply strict scrutiny to this. And, and uh, unless there's an absolute clear um, uh, uh, con uh, contradiction of religious liberty, we're not going to do anything and we're not going to intervene. And I mean, they can begin to take steps. Of, and again, it'll be incremental, but it, it will begin to take one step and one step. If you look at the schools, for example, the first step in what happened in the schools was school prayer. But it didn't end there. I mean, it ended with you start having devotions and the school couldn't do it. Teacher can't say prayer. Uh, no, you can't have prayer at football games. You know, it, it, it spread and spread and spread. And so I think that that's what we have to be careful of here is uh, th that there could be such a spread. And so we have to keep our guard up. I, you know, as, as Christians, I don't think we like to keep our guard up. We like to say, I'm going to I'm going to communicate the gospel of love. And I want to talk about God and, and how he is love and Jesus Christ. And we should. I'm not taking away from any of those things. But I think sometimes we are fearful that we become ungodly and that we become unkind and unloving if we stand on some of these principles. And I think that there has to be a way for us to say, look, I believe the Bible. I believe this is what the Bible teaches me. You know, I understand that you may not accept that, but I believe that. And that's the basis upon my conviction and what my actions are going to reflect. And so I think I think that's what we just have to do. So we have a listener or someone viewing this on YouTube and they're recognizing that these things are taking place in their community, in their uh, city, their town. They're recognizing it's happening in their schools and they understand, man, I got to get educated on this. I got to learn more on this. But what are some other practical steps that you can encourage them to get things moving forward to protect our religious liberties? One of the things I would say would be aggressive in seeking out information. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times I've talked to people that just kind of accept that what the school is teaching is okay. They accept what their elected officials are doing is okay. They don't pay attention, you know, Gosh, we get tired of listening to news sometimes, don't we? It's just negative, negative, negative. We don't want to, we don't pay attention to that. So I think an awareness is one of the first things we need to do. And we have need to have an aggressive awareness. We need to, to seek out the information to be sure we know what's going on. Secondly, as I said, um, because the, what I view as the paradigm shift to elected officials and mayors and governors, and boards of education and that kind of thing, I think you need to get be very aware of what those candidates are saying. Ask the questions of them. You know, what do you what do you believe should be taught in, about your uh, issue of religious liberty, about the Bible, about whenever it says that um, what what is being taught in the area of uh, uh, transgender, for example, and what what are you going to do in the with in the bathrooms where my kids are? are you gonna are you gonna mean that all the boys and girls can, have to go together, or are you gonna kind of allowed my daughter to be over here in, in the girls' restroom. I mean, I think you can ask those kind of questions. Uh, your, your national officials, you can say, what do you think about the Equality Act not having a res religious exception to it that would allow my pastor to preach this way? I think we need to be aggressive in asking questions. I think we need to be aggressive in encouraging people to run for these offices that are of like-minded faith. I think we need to be aggressive to try to uh, keep uh, – whether it's giving money for them or working for them or whatever to do those kinds of things. And I think we need to, uh, to keep our voice. Don't, don't, don't go silent because you're fearful that someone will criticize you or because you're afraid that someone will disagree with you. You know, we, we in addition to religious liberty, freedom, we have free speech still, in, particularly in certain areas. And so I would encourage people to be, be willing to speak up. One of the things that I would say is I think sometimes it's easy to look at this and get really discouraged. 
Um, but, you know, my hope is not in a president or political party or in any other elected official. My hope is in God and in Christ. And so, you know, Romans says, Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. Uh, the psalmist said, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. And so I think we need to not lose fact the fact of where our hope comes from. And even though we are discouraged and even though we are concerned, we're not without hope. We're a people with hope. And so I don't want uh, my message to be one of we're without hope because we definitely have hope. It's just that we have these difficulties in these days that we have to get through. But I think that God has given us some, some avenues that we can be strong, that we can stand in, that we can uh, be willing to speak to try to help make a difference. Uh, you know, I, I, I uh, said, I started this by saying I was more worried about what would happen to my kids in their area of ministry during their lifetime of ministry than my own. But part of my legacy may be, am I willing to stand up to try to protect what their legacy will be? And so I think we, we just have to be careful that we stand wow. strong. Okay. I'm going to ask this question because this personally comes from me. I'm a firm believer that many Christians and many Americans, quote unquote, do not fully understand the difference between liberty and freedom. Uh, we talk a lot about freedom. We talk a lot about liberty. Uh, we talk about how this nation, quote unquote, was built on freedom. I argue against that and say it was liberty. If you go back and you look at the Constitution, you look at the Declaration of Independence, it was all based on liberty. Um, you know, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Freedom was already there in their possession. What they were after was their liberty as citizens of the nation in which they would create. And so one of the things I believe is we have this blurred line when it comes to freedom and liberty. We believe they're one in the same. And I'm saying that to say you just brought up uh, freedom of speech. Right now, by law, we have the freedom to worship, the freedom to gather wherever we want to gather. But there's a key word being used here. Religious liberties are at stake. Is there... In, in definition, is there something or is it one and the same? And I'm just, I'm misunderstanding it myself because this is me personally. Is there a definitive difference between a religious liberty and a religious freedom? Well, that is a great question that can send you to the puzzle palace for a second to, to think <laughs> about the answer to that one. Um, you know, you're, you're right. In many circles, I think that religious liberty and religious freedom are um, intertwined and, and used synonymously. There can be, I think, a technical distinction between the two. Um, you know, when it talks about religion, the Constitution doesn't say freedom of religion. Uh, it talks about the, the free exercise thereof. And so, um, you know, I, I think a liberty can be a right that I have that is out there. I may not be free to exercise it at that moment, but technically it is a right that I have. I may have the right to religious, religiously express my, my opinion, but at that moment, I may not have the freedom to do it. So I think you can make a technical distinction between those two, but we, we tend to blur them a lot. I, well, it makes me, the reason I asked that question is it makes me wonder if that's where we're losing some of our momentum um, as Christians, because we're not paying attention to the verbiage, as you were talking about in some of these landmark cases, that word or those words put in that uh, understanding uh, could be one of those things where so many Christians go, oh, we still have our freedom. But there's such a fine line in all this, and it's so important for us uh, to really pay attention, to wake up what is happening, to understand the language, even though it's very difficult. I think we need to learn how to understand what is being spoken uh, in that. And it's so challenging. I, I get it. I, I definitely get it because um, I'm, I'm very uneducated in a lot of these areas and I'm having to re-educate, relearn and understand the verbiage because it's, you know, different right now between equity and equality. Uh, those words are being interchanged and slipped in a lot of times and people are thinking it's the one in the same. And I think a lot of times we think of religious freedom and liberties, oh, we kind of group it in. 
but I'm, I, I'm saying all that to say, I think it's important for us as Christians, as a representation of the body of Christ, to really educate ourselves as much as possible that we can, and to find the right people, find people such as jo Judge uh, Roy Sparkman, and be able to uh, get that help that we need, because there, there's people in our communities, there's people all the way around that can benefit us and help us further advance and defend our religious liberties that are really being attacked right now on so many levels in that. So I would give every one of my guests the opportunity to have the last word, the final word. Maybe I didn't get to have, uh, I didn't get to get a question that you would love to expound on. Maybe there was something you wanted to share that is really, you know, on your heart, in your mind right now, and you want to share that. So I want to give you the opportunity to have that final word, that last word. You may not have anything to share, but if there is, I want to give you that opportunity right now to share whatever it is. Right. Again, I thank you so much for having me. And I, I think that uh, it's so important for us as people of faith and people that support religious liberties to have an awareness of what is going on. We, we just can't stick our head in the sand and, and hope it's gonna go away and hope that it's going to get better. I think we have to take an awareness and then an aggressive awareness to try to do something about it. And uh, what I tried to do in a pastor's pit was to, to try to make it very real, very practical so that people could understand it. And uh, so to give a shameless plug here, I, you know, I would encourage people to, to buy the book of Pastor's Pitch. You can buy it at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or you can go to my website, judgeroyspartman.com. And, and maybe it will create a little bit of an awareness of how easily these things can slip in and how the impact can be so dramatic upon our pastor, the families, and the church so that they can, you can begin to understand why it's important that we stand up in these areas. And this is one of those things I want to say to everybody that is listening or watching. I, I, I know this book in which uh, Judge Roy Spartman just shared a pastor's pit. And he told you where to get it, visit his website. All that is in the link here at, on YouTube as well. And in our notes, in our podcast, all those links are there. But I know a lot of times as Christians, we have this tendency, well, I'm not a pastor, so why should I read the book? I want to encourage everybody, everybody is a part of the body of Christ to get your hands on this book because it, it, it's one of these things. Again, I, I try to remind Christians in general, you may not have a position as a pastor, but there's a, there's a command. It's not an option. It's a command. Go into all the world and make disciples. And so we all have this responsibility to equip and enlarge the kingdom of God. And I think this book is going to be a great tool for you to be able to have, to get some insight, to get some understanding and stuff, to be able to help us uh, continue because there is this war that is happening and we need to be attentive as, um, as, as we face these things. We need to know what's going on. And and I think you've written a great tool to be able to have that established. And I just, I greatly appreciate, you know, it's a little tough seeing the Baylor logo up in the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm trying to cover it up so you don't have to look at it. <laughs> but I do see a pastor spit in the background. So I, I was just kind of giving, giving a little bit of a hard time. Those that are uh, continual listeners of we, you know, my Southern accent definitely gives it away. I live in Eastern Tennessee in the Great Smoky Mountains, but I'm originally from Alabama. I'm a diehard Alabama Crimson Tide fan. So we have to give anybody and everybody <laughs> a hard time, uh, you know, with Baylor and stuff, but hey, cut, we'll, we'll cut some slack because Chip and Joanna, all, you know, my wife, definitely everybody that loves Chip and Joanna, they're there uh, near Baylor and, as well <laughs> and everything. So I just, I'm so grateful for you taking the time today to be a part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, such a wealth of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that you're sharing. I want to encourage everyone to make sure to go visit the website. Again, give us that website again. It's judgeroysparkman.com. I, I believe that there's just so much information that you have to offer. And just thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out. Ryan, thank you so much again for having me and for what you do and how you get the word out. I think it's important that we all grow where we're planted. Yes, sir. 
For everyone else that's listening, I genuinely hope and pray that this episode has equipped you, it has encouraged you, and it has challenged you to further advance the kingdom of God. Guys, until the next episode, we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.